Yo, what's up, guys? We're back, and this week it's for uh, UFC Rio Rancho, but I usually don't do uh, recaps for um, uh, past predictions lately. I mean, leave it. drop down in the comments if you want me to start doing recaps for more of the uh, previous shows, but, um, you know, I felt like uh, maybe we were obligated to talk about this show, UFC 247, a little bit, just because of all the controversy, everything like that. It, what, in my opinion, was kind of a... Uh, it was a little bit of a it was a it was a <laughs> it was a tough card for uh, the Texas Commission there, but um, yeah. So let's just go through it real fast. Uh, you know, with uh, Yusuf Zalal and uh, Austin Lingo, uh, you know, Yusuf went in there and he did his thing. He's twenty three years old and he dominated Lingo. He looked pretty good in all elements. He was flowing in there. He had a good time and uh, put it on Lingo. He took him down kind of like I thought, controlled him, and uh, just kind of dominated the fight. But uh. In this next fight, Andre Ewell against Jonathan Martinez. Uh, this is, we're gonna start. We're gonna start getting into, um, you know, a bit of the shenanigans a little bit with the referees, with the commission, because uh, you know, first off, I've never seen this before, where they said that they uh, had a computer sh shut down or break down. It's like I thought you guys wrote down the decisions on paper. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe they they were writing them in a computer for this event, but I guess the computer shut down. They had to take like ten minutes it seemed like for this freaking uh, decision, and then it comes out and um, yeah, we're gonna go to MMA decisions here, right? And you have um, this one right here, the first one, Andre Yule and Jonathan Martinez, right? So you know, two got one, two guys gave it, or one guy gave it to Yule twenty nine twenty eight, which. You know, I thought Martinez won 30-27, and I bet on Andre Ewell in a parlay. I gave him as a parlay for you guys, so, you know, obviously I wanted Ewell to win, but I thought Martinez won the fight, and, um, you know, Danny uh, D'Alejandro, maybe. I, I guess uh, one, uh, these are all the um, decisions from media members. I guess one person did say Andre Ewell won from MMA Junkie, so, you know, um, Looking at the fight, I thought Martinez won, but if you are a uh, guy who missed the body shots and we missed a little bit of the damage, I could see how you could give the fight to you. Or he was, he was active, he was moving around, he definitely landed some damage, or not damage, but just some good shots. He had uh, Martinez looked like he was a little bit hurt at times, and uh, the way that he shells up, I don't think it's a good look for the judges, but. You know, um, this guy right here, he's Joe Solis. This motherfucker, dude, this fool had some horrible decisions. And this is the first one of the night. 30-27, Andre Yule. Um, indefensible, man. I mean, you could not tell me that, 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 how could you say Andre Yule won every single round of that, of that fight? I mean, that's just pathetic. Uh, you know, I thought Jonathan Martinez won the fight, so props to Jonathan Martinez, uh, Good performance there. Uh, good job by Andre Yule. I mean, it was actually a good fight. They went back and forth. They uh, did their thing, but just unfortunate there. Even, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Dana White was bringing up this fight, thinking that he said uh, he thought Martinez won. But, you know, then on the next one, Journey Newsom went in there. He did his thing. He knocked out uh, Domingo Pilarte. And uh, I think that's probably going to be the end for Domingo in the UFC, man. I mean, he started off pretty fast, pretty good, but... Uh, Got knocked out in less than a minute, and um, 0-2 now. Uh, I don't think he's going to be sticking around. I would be kind of surprised. Maybe they'll give him one more fight, but 135 is stacked, man. And, uh, you know, good win for Journey Newsom. Next fight, another 135 fight, Mario Batista, Miles Johns. And, uh, you know, I did pick Mario for the upset, and he went in there and he did the thing. You know, he uh, flying knee, ground and pound, took him out. Good, uh, showed good killer instinct in there because he did... Uh, you know, go for the finish right away, pounced on him, and didn't let him, uh, you know, recover at all. So, good win there for Mario Batista. He went in there, he got it done in the second round. The first one was real close. Uh, don't know who the judges gave it to, but it was a 50-50 round. Maybe Miles Jones won the round, so uh, Mario knew he had to go in there, get a little bit more urgent in the second round, and uh, he did just that and got the win. So, good win by Mario Batista. And then this next fight, man... Uh, Terrible performance from Alex Morono, man. I mean, he, K.S. Williams, uh, you could even tell just by looking at him, man. Uh, even if you watch one of his fights, he's explosive and he hits hard. And what does Alex Morono do? The first 20 seconds of the fight, 10 seconds of the fight, he goes in there and he wants to bang with this guy. And doing that is, is just, it's Russian roulette, man. He got hit, he went down, and that was it. So, horrible decision by Alex Morono. I mean, I feel like if you would have played this one out, been smart, uh, Felt him out early on, you know, let 
Chaos get that nervous energy out that he probably was going to get out from his UFC debut, throw some wild punches, he probably would have, you know, figured out a way to win the fight. But he had terrible decision making, and um, you know that's what led to his loss. And uh, obviously, up next on this next fight, man, I mean, this is one of the worst decisions I've ever seen. It it really is uh, horrible. I mean, Lauren Murphy, she's a tough chick. She did a good job, but. What are you giving her the decision for? If walking forward and eating f- fucking punches to the face? Like, eating body shots? Like, <laughs> Andrea Lee was slipping all of her shots. She <laughs> this was one of the... I, I don't know, man. I mean, when we got... uh, You know, we got over on that... um, Yule, maybe they just needed to come get us back. But, man, I mean, I, I, I really don't know what to say on that. I mean, uh, one second. I'm going to get... I'm trying to... Uh, here it is. But man, I mean, look at every single person here on the uh, for the um, media scored it for Andrea Lee. A lot of people had it thirty twenty seven. All the rounds going to Andrea Lee, and then this motherfucker Danny Alejandro thirty to twenty seven for Lauren Murphy. Ha- man, I mean that's inconceivable. It's impossible to have a scorecard like that. That's just absolutely ridiculous. Just terrible. Man, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, Andrea Lee won the fight. She won the fight. Um, you know, it might have not been the best performance, but, man, I mean, she she dominated the fight. She won every round, in my opinion. I mean, if you want to give Murphy one round, you can give Murphy one round. But she won. Man, I, I, I don't know really know what to say about that one. That was a horrible decision there by the judges. Andrea Lee deserves a win. Uh, I would file... Uh, a freaking uh, protest with the commission, man. I mean, I heard uh, Joe Rogan saying during this fight, one of the uh, judges was like on, on their phone, not even looking at the fight. I mean, just terrible, man. I, I, I feel bad for Andrew Lee. Uh, definitely deserve to get the win there. But uh, Lauren Murphy pulls it off. Uh, split decision win. Uh, lucky Lauren Murphy right there. And moving on here, we got another controversial decision. Trevin Giles, James Krause, which I actually thought James Krause won this fight, but... This one, you know, you can't say it was a robbery. You can't say, um, you know, this isn't a Martinez. This isn't an Andrew Lee. Those are robberies, in my opinion. I feel like Martinez got robbed. Andrew Lee got robbed. Like, they put a gun to their head and <laughs> took all their money, all their uh, fucking win money. But uh, this one, I don't think you could say it was a robbery. I mean, it was a close fight. You could say Trevin Giles won. You could say James Krause won. I thought Krause won the first and the third round personally. But, you know... Once again, the reasoning for the controversy here is Joe Solis again. I mean, here he is again, right? We already talked about Joe Solis. And um, the first round of the fight, he gives it to Trevin Giles. Man, if you watch this fight, James Krause had his back for four minutes of the round. He almost choked him out. He he dominated the round. And there's no way you could give the first round to Trevin Giles. And that is what cost him the fight. Because the other two judges gave him, the th- uh, or one judge gave him, uh, or two judges gave him the third round. So if he would have given him the first round, which he deserved the first round, he would have won the fight. And sh- shout out to James Krausman. I didn't get to talk about him. I didn't talk about this fight. But he stepped in, man. He was stepped in on 18 hours notice, went in there. And uh, that's a hard thing to do because you have to get used to these fights mentally as well. I mean, as long as with the training and it did seem like he got tired in there. I do feel like if he had a full camp, he definitely would have won this fight even at 85s. And, uh, you know, but um, he had a valiant effort in there and he almost got the finish in the first round. But, you know, you have to prepare yourself mentally. I mean, people have to say like, man, like 18 hours before this, he wasn't even thinking he was going to fight. He was just going to corner someone. He wasn't in that, uh, you know kill mode mentality fight mode mentality he wasn't thinking of anything he has to snap right into that get ready to go so i mean Krause is a gangster man a big uh move from him and i heard that he got a new uh ufc contract from that so hopefully he got paid fat for that and he's uh you know getting paid for these next few fights and i'm excited to see him uh go back down to 170 and do his thing because uh he's still on that big win streak at 170 i don't think this diminishes his stock and uh you know, good on James Krause and uh, good job by James Krause there. And uh, good job by Trevin Giles too. I mean, that one, like I said, wasn't a robbery. Krause, or Tr- Giles did his thing as well. And uh, if the judges would have gave him the win, then that would have been good. But uh, pff, 
man, I mean, the way that it happened was not right. You know, you can't give uh, Trevin Giles that first round. But up next, Derek Lewis, Alir Latifi. And I actually thought Derek Lewis won. I know a lot, some people thought Latifi won. But Latifi didn't do anything where he, when he had the position to me. And uh, Lewis did have those few flurries. Whenever there was big moments in the fight, it was from Derek Lewis. And uh, he got the win. He did well. Uh, you know, I didn't think it was a good performance from him. You know, he was getting taken down real easily. And uh, didn't really like exactly what I saw from him in that fight. But, um, you know, he was able to get the win. He showed off some flying knees, some uh, switch kicks. And... Uh, you know, disappointing per, uh, effort, or not disappointing effort, but disappointing result for Latifi. You know, I feel like he looked pretty good, but didn't get the nod on the on the judges. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, Derek Lewis gets it done there. Dan Ige versus Mursad Bektik. Uh, you know, thought it was a horrible performance from Bektik, man. I didn't think Bektik looked good at all. Um, but Ige went in there, he did his thing, and uh, split decision. I actually thought that Ige deserved the unanimous decision there, but. Uh, you know, back to just won the second round to me. And then uh, Justin Toffa, Juan Adams. Um, man, I actually, as the week was progressing, uh, I actually was went from Juan Adams to leaning towards Justin Toffa. Just from hearing what Juan Adams was saying during the media, I mean, really, really turned me off. You know, talking about he doesn't cut his nails, so he doesn't have to grapple with people. He's doing pedicures. He's laughing all week and just didn't really like where his head was at. It didn't seem right to me. And, uh, you know, I should have came on here and changed my pick, but I obviously didn't do it. And uh, good on Justin Toffa going in there and, um, you know, smashing Juan Adams, beating him in a minute, and tw- less than two minutes, minute and 59 seconds. So knocked him out and did his thing. So good job, Justin Toffa. And then uh, Valentina, man, um, scary performance. You know, Caitlin really did nothing, man. I don't, I mean, did she land a strike on the feed? Maybe uh, a few, a couple, but. You know, Valentina dominated the, at range, took her down, and eventually got the finish. I do feel like maybe they could have let it go a little longer, but it was almost like a uh, it was like a um, mercy finish. You know, Caitlyn did nothing and uh, got destroyed. So Valentina, man, uh, doesn't look like she has very many, many challengers in that division. Um, I don't know if she's gonna go fight Amanda. If she's gonna fight. Uh, Jojo Calderwood, Roxanne Montefiore, but uh, we're going to have to see what happens. And, uh, you know, Valentina looks extremely dominant right now. And then up next to this next fight, uh, this is another fight, a lot of controversy, a lot of people talking about this fight. Amazing fight. I mean, this is one of the best uh, um, title fights in recent memory right up there with, uh, you know, I feel like this fight maybe was even better than the Covington versus Kamaru Usman fight because uh, it was more surprising. You know, Dominic Reyes came out there. Took it to him in that first round, really uh, had Jones a little bit um, uncomfortable, stunned in that first round. I don't know if he hurt him, but uh, he definitely, uh, you know, had him a little bit nervous in that first round, had him on his heels, and uh, he came in there and he did exactly what he said. He he went in there and he um, took it to him. He didn't, um, you know, leave anything, anything uh, out there, and he uh, went for the kill, and you know, he did great. I mean, he did way better than I thought he was going to do. But uh, I actually still had Jones winning 48-47. And I feel like, you know, with the second and the third rounds, those rounds were extremely close. The only rounds that I feel like were very definitive were the first round for Dominic Reyes and the fourth and the fifth round for John Jones. So I feel like John Jones did have the two definitive rounds to so the one definitive round for Reyes. And, um, you know... I feel like the second and third round, like I said, were very close. And I feel like Jones won the won the third round, I believe. I, I don't exactly remember 100%, but I believe I had Jones winning the third, fourth, and fifth rounds. Um, if you had Reyes winning, you know, I can't argue with that. Reyes, uh, obviously, I guess I'm in the minority here on the media. A lot of people have Reyes 47-48 here. Um, you know, I know Dana White said he had Reyes up 3-1 going into the fifth round. So he had Reyes 47-48. And um, the co- main controversy, though, I mean, if it would have been uh, two 48-47s for Jones and a 48-47 for Reyes, I think some people would be complaining. I obviously think they'd be talking about the rematch because that was an excellent fight. Um, and uh, I think it's actually, you know, deserving of a rematch. But Joe Solis again, man, 49-46 Jones. It's, this scorecard is just not, I don't know. I do say the second and third rounds are close, but I feel like, you know, I don't know, it's not indicative of the fight, and that's why everyone got so pissed off, because they were like, 
man, how can you give a 49-46? Uh, we just saw a fight that was razor thin. You're going to say it was 4-1 Jones. And, you know, I have to rewatch it because I do say those rounds are close. But I do feel like Reyes, you know, he deserved two rounds at least, maybe even three rounds. So, uh, you know, I could see why people were frustrated with that. But, you know, I don't feel like that was a robbery. I really don't. I don't feel like that was like a Lee decision. That was like a Andre Ewell decision. It wasn't a robbery. You know, Jones, uh, he did enough, man. He he did enough in those fourth and fifth rounds in the judges' eyes to retain the title. And uh, Dom Reyes got tired, and Jones showed that heart, man. I mean, that guy has a hell of a chin, and he's not going away. And he's going to fight hard. So in those fourth and fifth rounds, he wanted it more than Dom, and he took it from him. You know, he took the fight. So John Jones uh, retains his title there. He got it done. And, um... You know, good on John Jones. That was a great job from him. And uh, great job by Dom Reyes as well. I hope we get to see that fight again. I don't know if they're going to do an immediate rematch. Obviously, the two guys on this Rio Rancho card have something to say about that. But, um, yeah, we're going to start breaking down this card. But, you know, the first thing I want to say, um, I heard, uh, you know, Mr. Arkansas's video. I know a lot of people, you know, have an issue with him. He rubs some people the wrong way. But, you know, I do agree with the man. I mean, he's doing a good thing with this uh Prediction Wars, he's shouting people out, he's giving people um, some promo, some buzz, and, uh, you know, obviously it's going to help his channel out as well, or he wants to help his channel out as well, and, you know, I want his channel to go as well, you know, I, I think he's funny, you know, some of those content where he's screaming, he's going crazy, I, I know that could rub some people the wrong way, so, you know, my recommendation, Arkansas, if you're watching my video, is, uh, you know, when you do those, uh, like, the Predictor Wars, the standings, do a video where it's like 10 minutes, man, where you're just, or maybe 15 minutes, and just do the standings, talk about the divisions a little bit, talk about everyone's score maybe for a minute, but don't go on these tangents, don't like go crazy, and I feel like more people will be inclined to watch those shorter videos and then continue on through watching, you know, uh, the whole league if they can kind of, uh, you know, see that it's only like a 15 minute video, 10 minute, if if it's two hours, it's a little daunting, you know, they have to get through that whole, the whole breakdown, the recap that you did, and, uh, and then they get to hear the results, the standings, and, um, you know, I like hearing that, I know you have a core audience that likes hearing that, but I know, I feel like, you know, you could maybe wrap in everyone's audience a little bit easier if you did, like, short video, you said who's in the lead, who's not, you know, and, uh, even if, you know, I'll, I'll start reposting your, uh, your videos as well for the results, if, uh, you allow me to do that, you know, uh, I don't, like, I don't know how to contact you, man, but, uh, so, uh, I'm just talking to you on this video, I guess, but, uh, yeah, so, if you hear this video, you know, um, just, uh, shoot a comment down or talk or say something in one of your videos where, uh, you know, um, if I'm, a, if you want me to, uh, you know, put it in the community tab, like your, um, standings videos, and if you do, you know, if you want me to do that, I'll do that for you, and, um, yeah, so I just feel like, you know, his predictor wars is a good thing for everyone, man. I mean, it's fun. It's a competition. He's shouting everyone out. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I mean, whoever has the best picks has the best picks. And uh, they're going to win that competition. So, to me, you know, it's a cool thing. But, uh, you know, I know everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, just me personally, you know, if you haven't heard of it, if you have heard of it, I, I just think it's a cool uh, cool idea it's a fun thing to go watch so you know check it out and that's my uh, recommendation to arkansas as well but yeah so now we're moving on to this real rancho card and uh make sure to uh, comment like subscribe uh, put down in the comments obviously who you're betting on what you thought of 247 and yeah man i mean we had a pretty decent streak going with our probably the week and it was andre you or andrea lee so uh i guess you could say we got a uh, lucky decision on uh, andre you but Came back, got burned on Andrea Lee. So we're going to move on, move fresh on to this card. Uh, no excuses, I guess. Even though I feel like after we got over on the Andre Yule, we probably should have, uh, you know, won our money. But um, moving on, Mark De La Rosa, Holly on Paiva. And uh, we got the first fight of the night here. It's a flyweight fight. And it's pretty interesting, you know, Mark De La Rosa and Montana are on the same card. They're obviously married. So that's pretty cool. And, uh, you know, Holly on Paiva, he's in desperate need of a victory here, man. Paiva, he's had a rough 0-2 start to his UFC career. He lost a close split decision. You know, he could have won in his UFC debut versus Kai Kaikara France. And then in the second fight, you know, the fight was stopped due to a cut in the first round. So he's been having some bad luck. But he's likely getting, you know, one final opportunity to put, or sh put up or shut up here against De La Rosa because, you know, they don't give these flyweights a lot of rope, man. And uh, 
Paiva, you know, he's a forward pressure striker. He's a brawler. Definitely has heavy hands. And uh, when he connects, his opponents will feel the power. You could tell. I mean, he had Bontrain hurt a little bit. Cut his eye open. And uh, he has a heavy jab. Nice low kicks. Uh, really nice straight and overhand right. He'll throw really nice tight hooks. He'll throw in combination. And uh, he'll attack the body as well. He's good at throwing straight shots uh, to the body. Followed by a tight left hook or a right hook that... You know, catch opponents flush, catch opponents when they're not really expecting it. And he will throw some solid front kicks, round kicks, high kicks. He even throws some spinning kicks sometimes, but he's kind of rare with the kicks. He's definitely more of a puncher. His cardio, his power, his durability, or his calling cards, man, he drowns opponents. A lot of forward pressure. He'll get them tired. He'll break their wills. And in exchanges, he's durable. He'll, uh, you know, he will float his chin. He is a little bit hittable, but he's willing to take a shot to give his own. And, uh, you know, when he lands, he usually hurts guys more than they hurt him. But Paiva definitely, you know, can struggle to cut the cage off at times. And he was pot shot a little bit from the outside against Kaikara France. But he definitely packs power. And for a flyweight, you know, he has three knockouts. He's never been finished. And, uh, you know, the only time he's been finished by strikes was, uh, you know, with that doctor stoppage in his last fight where he got finished with a cut. Both these guys are bigger fly flyweights. You know, Holyon Paiva's a bigger flyweight. Um, uh, Martel Rosa's actually campaigned at 35s quite a bit in the UFC. But Paiva's going to have the reach and the height advantage. And he's a pretty big guy. I mean, uh, he's more of a like a lean, uh, lanky guy. But he's uh, he's he, he's big for the division. And uh, he'll look to occasionally, you know, close the distance, shoot those singles, doubles. And uh, he likes to get you against the cage where he kind of will chain wrestle. He's also strong in the clinch. And he'll punch his way into the clinch and out of the clinch very well. he also, you know, look to attack the neck from standing. Has uh, nice standing guillotines. And, um, you know, he'll also look to get on the back. Look for standing rear naked chokes. And good scrambler as well. He's not a great wrestler. But he's good at creating 50-50 positions. Uh, ending up on top. Sweeping. And in his last match, uh, he showed very good balance and scrambling ability when he was fighting Bontarine. Uh, you know, it lasts for a short period of time, but uh, he's very good at defending takedowns with switches. And off his back, he has good sweeps. He'll attack with triangles, arm bars. And, um, you know, he hasn't gotten many submissions over his career, but he's definitely dangerous on the mat. And uh, he only has three submissions. He has been submitted one time. And he has excellent cardio. He's always looking to inflict damage as well. And his style is usually enough to uh, win the output battle and thus the decision. You know, he's 12-1. and one. In decisions with the one loss being a uh, controversial split decision so could be 13 and 0 in decision so when this goes to the scorecards uh you know this guy usually wins holy on paiva but uh he's gonna be facing mark de la rosa here who's been up and down so far in the ufc he's two and three but he has lost two consecutive fights and he's also kind of in desperate need of a victory and uh he has a similar style on on the feet to paiva you know he's a uh, Forward pressure guy, he likes to box, and uh, he will throw some heavy lead counter left hooks. He'll throw left hook right uppercut combos. Uh, he has, uh, you know, hard hooks in combination as well, pretty fast hands. And he will unload with hooks, uppercuts, body shots, and, you know, he will walk opponents down, slip counter, pull counter, uh, nice low calf kicks. He will throw some hard body kicks, but, um, you know, he could be flat-footed. He doesn't really move his head, and he can get hit with some nice shots coming in. But, you know, he also has a good chin. I would say Paiva's more durable, hits harder, though. And, um, you know, Mark De La Rosa also isn't the greatest athlete. I feel he's kind of going to struggle with, uh, you know, the speed, the explosiveness of Paiva. And uh, his constant forward pressure and leg kicks, you know, he needs that to wear opponents out to kind of get him on his speed. And he could start breaking them. But he does have some hot pop in his hands. Um, you know, he has one TKO. He's never been finished by strikes, so it's not like he has knockout power. But uh, he can hurt guys. He can wear on him a little bit. And he's physical as well, especially for 125 pounds. Um, you know, he's been able to have some success in the UFC at 125. He does try to use his boxing to get inside, push fighters to the cage, and uh, he'll grab double learn hooks, the plum clinch, uh, good clinch takedowns, and he's good at punching his way in as well. He 
kind of blends his takedowns in pretty good with the striking. He'll go up, down, body head, then, you know, mix in a takedown. Nice high crotch, single leg, and good reactive doubles as well. And on top, you know, he's heavy. He has nice elbows, uh, good back takes, great control. And he's good at locking in the body triangle, getting the arena could choke, but he can be taken down himself. Um, you know, he does have a solid guard. He has fast hips and, uh, you know, triangles, arm bars. He has six submissions. But he has been submitted when he fought Tim Elliott. And, um, you know, like I said, I do feel like both these guys are similar styles. I just feel like uh, physically, Pipe has a lot of advantages. He's taller. He has a longer reach. He hits harder. He's more explosive. I feel like he has better kicks. And, um, you know, I feel like he's kind of better, uh, you know, if he can, you know, keep him at the end of his kicking and punching range, keep De La Rosa moving backwards. I actually feel like Pive is also the better scrambler. And I think he's going to be able to deny a lot of the takedowns of De La Rosa. And De La Rosa is going to need to get inside of Paiva, land shots. And uh, he needs to mix it up, get takedowns, control against the cage. But I think both these guys are going to have cardio. I think Pive is going to throw more output, be more durable, hit harder. Um, I think he should wear down De La Rosa a little bit. I think De La Rosa may start fast, get a takedown. But over time, I think he's going to get outstruck, uh, you know, progressively worse and worse. I think... Pipe is going to put visible damage on him, you know, like maybe swell him up a little bit, cut him open. And I just think he's going to outwork him, get a decision victory. So the pick for me is a Holly on Piva via decision. And then up next year, we have a women's uh, bantamweight fight with uh, Macy Chiesa taking on uh, Nico Bontanio. And, uh, you know, Macy, she's getting back on the horse. She had a disappointed loss to Lita Landsberger last time out. And she was a massive favorite of that fight. She looked uh, on her way to their top 15 in a hurry, but all that was halted. And, you know, she's going to need to work her ba way back up here against Nico Montano. And Nico, you know, she's returning. She's followed a log layoff. Uh, she had a losing effort against Juliana Pena. And Montano, you know, she actually hasn't won a fight since her title win over Roxanne in uh, December of 2017. So it's been a long time. And uh, she won that fight at flyweight. And she's actually had almost all the success in her career at flyweight. You know, she's 6-0 at flyweight, including her ultimate fighter fights. And at bantamweight, she's just won it three in her career. So it's really struggled at bantamweight. But, you know, I expect this to be more of like a grappling match here. Um, You know, Macy, she's a powerful striker. She has length. And she's definitely going to have a 7-inch reach advantage here, 4-inch height advantage. She has some, you know, dangerous straight punches, kicks, because she does have short-range power. But she's still very green on the feet. She's a plotter. Doesn't move her head. And she will take shots to give shots. Uh, she is durable. But, um, you know, with her defense, she really isn't comfortable striking. She always really initiates the clinch in almost every fight. And Nico, you know, I'd say she's maybe the more technical striker. But she's not nearly as dangerous. I mean, she will also throw some jabs, overhand rights, uh, some solid kicks. She does hold her hands low though but she has some good movement and she's decent at you know waiting for her opponents to overextend so she can clinch up and you know in the clinch uh she's very strong she has good knees she has good elbows uh, good heavy hips good head positioning and uh, good takedowns in the clinch as well as good takedown defense heavy hips i do feel like uh you know, this fight will hit, hit the clinch a lot because Nico will be looking for it. Macy crashes in with punches a lot. Macy looks for it. And uh, on the feet, I think Nico's going to be outgunned a little bit. Um, you know, even maybe get TKO'd. But in the clinch, uh, I think Macy's going to be a little bit bigger, maybe physically stronger. But um, Nico, you know, she surprises people and she has good uh, takedowns there. And Macy showed terrible takedown defense in the clinch in her last fight. She was... Taken down, controlled by Lena Landsberg. Really didn't do anything off of her back. And in her match with Sarah Mc, uh, Morass, she was taken down in round one and uh, didn't really get up until the dying seconds of the round. So I feel like uh, Nika will probably be able to get takedowns control on top. And uh, she just needs to do that for two rounds and then survive not getting clipped or finished. And uh, Nika's scrappy. She's never been finished. And uh, I feel like Nika's going to hit takedowns and uh, control the fight. So my pick's going to be... Uh, Nico Montano to pull a, sh a slight upset here and uh, get a decision victory. And up next year, we have really good matchmaking and a really nice fight with uh, Casey Kenny taking on Marab Divalashvili. And Marab, he's bounced back from that rough UFC start. He's won back-to-back -back fights. He's really dominated those fights. 
And he's a dominating wrestler, man. I mean, he overwhelms opponents with pace and pressure. I believe he's already first ever in UFC history for Bantamweight takedowns. And he's only had, uh, you know, a few uh, fights in the UFC. I believe three or four. And uh, he's recently competed, uh, you know, in World Sandbell Championships. And it was all the way up to 155 pounds. And he still managed to get the silver medal. He was undersized in a lot of those fights. And, uh, you know, he did a good job there. And Casey Kenny, you know, he's had an impressive start to his UFC career. He's the former LFA double champ. And he's began his UFC career 2-0, and two decision victories. So, off to a good start here. He's a little bit undersized at 35s. But, uh... Hasn't let that stop at all, man. I mean, he even won a fight in his last fight against uh, Manny Bermudez at a catch weight of 140. So, uh, you know, he doesn't care. He'll go up there. He'll fight anybody. But uh, taking on Marab, man, he's taking on a guy who's a ball of energy. And uh, Marab, I mean, he arguably pushes the fast pace in the entire UFC. I mean, they need to get Marab and uh, Tony Ferguson, you know, they need to test them, see if they're related or something on, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, go to... Uh, so one of those websites to see if they're related because they both push pretty fast place in the UFC. But uh, on the feet, you know, Marab, he's good. He's unorthodox. He stays on the outside. He bounces around and uh, he'll jump in, uh, time jump kicks, spinning attacks, blitz attacks. He's a really nice straight overhand right. He kind of will wing punches, but I feel like he definitely has the superior firepower in this fight. He hits harder. And uh, he has one of the best single leg takedowns in MMA. I mean, once he lands a couple, he'll open his striking up that much more. He'll start faking level changes, coming up with hooks, uppercuts. And he has nice low kicks. He's a little bit open on the on the feet. I mean, he spins a lot. He has his hands down. And, uh, you know, he is hittable. But he has superior firepower. Like I said, he hits harder. And uh, I believe if he goes forward, keeps the pressure, he jams Kenny's kicks. He's going to have a lot of success striking. You know, Kenny looked very uncomfortable striking moving backwards versus uh, Manny Bermudez. And he got rocked a couple times. And Rob should be the fighter going forward. I think he's going to throw more volume as well. I think he's more durable. He hits a little bit harder. And he's shown more composure once the fight hits the mat in his last two fights. You know, instead of going for the back or, you know, places where his opponents can scramble, he's stayed inside the full guard, gone half guard, uh, worked short shots, worked control more. Um, he did show some nice hammer fist elbows, and in previous fights though, like versus Ricky Simone, Ricky or uh, Frankie Signs, he uh, you know was going for uh, low risk or low uh, percentage back takes, things like that, and uh, you know giving up top position. But um, you know he had the cardio to hit mat returns, get massive amount of takedowns, and he can easily get 10, 15 takedowns in a fight. One of the things, you know, I feel like he has to be a little bit worried about, though, in this fight is he can be controlled against the fence a little bit. He will look for trips, for throws, but uh, in this fight, he can't let Kenny burn clock by holding him against the cage. And Marab, he has been taken down in the UFC and in a grappling match I saw against a much, uh, you know, bigger guy that looked like a great wrestler. But, man, he showed some sick scrambling ability. He was flattened out in full back mount that BJJ Max. He was able to... You know, get out reverse position. He's just non-stop, man. I mean, he has a motor. And uh, he isn't a submission threat, really. He only has one in his career. But uh, I think he's going to be extremely hard to submit. He was submitted by Ricky Simone. But in my opinion, that was because he got knocked out on the takedown. And, um, you know, he didn't even tap. So it was a controversial decision there. But uh, Casey Kenny, you know, he's more technical striking, I would say. He likes to uh, move laterally, walk opponents into low kicks, into body kicks, jumping kicks, straight punches. And he's going to be the quicker guy. He's going to want to walk Mirab into kicks, you know, and then uh, win the scrambles. That's really his thing. He, he, you know, is a little bit, you know, technical on the feet. Then he tries to win scrambles. But I feel like he's hittable. He doesn't really have great hands or power. And he can hold his hands low. He can float his chin and... I feel on the feet, Marab's going to be the one winning the striking because he's going to be walking Kenny down. I don't think he's going to respect the power, and I think he's going to throw more volume and uh, land the bigger shots. But Kenny, you know, he's going to have to win the wrestling scrambles. And, um, you know, he may be undersized, but he's very physically strong in the clinch. He's the, like a judo, uh, uh, you know, he's multi-time champion for the U.S. And, you know, he shows that he can control opponents on the feds. He has nice trips, good throws. And he's good at top position, you know, good back takes. Uh, he's actually been taking out 10 times in two UFC fights, though. And um, he's just good at, you know, creating scrambles where he ends up on top and 
holds top position longer than his opponents. He's the big ground and power guy, but is dangerous for submissions. I just don't know if he's going to be able to hold down a guy like uh, Rob Devalishvili. I also have seen Kenny get tired in fights, especially in round three against Manny Bermudez. And um, Rob's going to make him work. He's going to constantly be on the feet or on the ground working. And the ground, um, you know, um, or I'm saying he won't give Rob any time to rest. I, I think Rob uh, is going to be a lot stronger than Kenny in the clinch. I think he's going to be the better wrestler. And Kenny doesn't really shoot takedowns. I think Rob's going to walk him down constantly. I think he's going to land the bigger shots, mix takedowns. I don't think he's going to control Kenny a lot, but... I see this fight looking like the Ricky Simone versus Rob fight where maybe Kenny gets free or stands up but gets taken back down. He's getting outstruck and I think Rob will actually get a finish here because I see Kenny scrambling hard first couple rounds but losing, taking damage. And then the third round when he gets more tired, I think Rob's going to be merciless in TKO. Him. So I'm going with the Rob via finish in the third round. And another great matchup here up next with uh, Ray Borg taking on Rogerio Bontarine. And Ray Borg, he's making the drop back down to flyweight. He did have a two-fight stretch at 135. And he went one and one in those two fights. But flyweight, you know, is his weight class. He worked his way up to a title shot there. And he's going to be looking to do so again. He is 26 years old. So he's still, you know, very much, uh, you know, in his prime. He has the best years ahead of him. And for Rogerio Bontrin, you know, he's had an impressive start to his UFC career. He's won back-to-back -back matches. He's undefeated so far. And he's 16-1 overall, and he could, you know, jump into the title mix of flyweight with the win here, potentially. But, you know, we all kind of know about Ray Borg right now, right? Or by now, right? You know, he's, uh, you know, an athletic guy. He, he's an elite wrestler. And his striking, you know, has gotten better, but uh, I feel like it's regressed a little bit in his last couple of matches. I don't know if that's because he's at 135 or what, but he definitely relies a lot on blitzes. He'll throw the overhead right, straight left, dart in, dart out. Good uppercut. He's very fast, but you know I don't like his defense. Uh, he'll kind of just use a high guard head movement and uh, just walk himself into the clinch and doesn't punch his way in. Sometimes he does, you know, have some power at times. He showed that, and uh, he's a good chin. He's a tough guy. Um, you know, he's never been put away, and he's an elite wrestler. You know, good explosive double legs. He'll go for the single. Uh, use that to take the back. Uh, good job of um, you know just chain wrestling. Always working on top. He has good elbows. He's always looking to move to mount, move to the back, look for front chokes. And he's just always moving, always creating scrambles. Uh, he'll attack off his back, almost plot his arm bars. Uh, excellent at getting out of the, the back position, which he'll probably need in this fight. I mean, when he was fighting uh, Juicy A. Formigu, who's one of the best back takers in the sport, he was able to get away from his back positioning multiple times, which, which is incredibly impressive. Uh, he showed really good cardio, and he always does, especially in his last fight. I mean, just uh, outworked Gabriel and uh, beat him to the punch, beat him to the, you know, takedowns and won the decision there. And, uh, you know, Bontri, you know, he is going to be fighting another flyweight, so I don't think he's going to be able to necessarily gas guys out like he would at 35. But he's probably going to be in better shape himself. I do think it's striking maybe a little bit, a little bit, look a little bit more sharp, you know, but, uh, you know, like I said, Bontrine, you know, he's a good guy. And he's a, a big, powerful flyweight. He's a switch stance guy. But he spends a lot of his time in southpaw. He isn't the fastest guy, but he definitely has breaks. I mean, he has big power, very durable. And he's always, uh, you know, pressuring forward, looking to cut off the cage. He has a nice jab. but uh, He has power. He'll jab, double jab his way in. Good straight overhand left. And he loves to use the straight overhand left to start combinations, you know, overhand left to a right hook. Um, he'll throw a right hook, left hook combination. He's good at slipping and ripping. He'll attack the body as well. Good leg kicks, body kicks. And he can wing a little bit with his punches and get a little bit wild. He could throw from too far out. But, you know, he, he definitely, you know, when he goes forward and he starts winging, these guys have to respect his power. But he can be a little bit low volume and, uh, you know, kind of hang back a little bit, but he definitely has a great chin. He took some huge shots against uh, Magomed Bibulatov. He never took a backward step. And uh, he also absorbed uh, some heavy shots to the body. And at range, you know, Bontrin uh, struggled with the speed of Bibulatov. He kind of got outstruck there. And he also had a huge bomb against Holly on Paiva that opened him up and uh, rocked him a little bit. But that cuts him to invigorate Bontrin in that fight. And shortly after, he was coming forward. 
He was winging wild hooks over Andy Linder, a nasty knee that split pipe open and finished the fight. I mean, it was a crazy fight. Both guys got rocked. Both guys got uh, the fight stopped to get their cuts checked. And, uh, you know, eventually they stopped the fight because the cut was so bad on Paiva. But, uh, you know, Patrin, he gets hurt, but he's very hard to take out. He recovers quickly. And um, he has three KLTKOs, but I believe, you know, only one was due to strikes from standing position. Um, and he did finish his last fight due to a cut. And he's an excellent grappler. You know, we should see some awesome scrambles in this fight. Uh, Bontrin is a black belt. He's comfortable wherever the fight goes on the mat. Uh, on top, on bottom. He showed excellent timing on his level changes against Paiva. He kind of struggled to get in on the legs against Paiva Lotov. But he showed his strength when he could against Paiva. He uh, was able to get in on the double. Back Paiva to the cage. Elevated slam multiple times. He's a farmer guy, so... Obviously, he has that farmer strength. And in Bontrin's match with uh, Bibolotov, Bibolotov was able to take him down four times. But, um, you know, he was able to land some throws, some clinch takedowns against the cage. But Bontrin's takedown defense is solid. I do feel like Borg is probably the better wrestler. But when it hits the mat is where the fun will begin because Bontrin has excellent sweeps, excellent scrambles. He'll attack with arm bars, triangles, omoplatas. And uh, in his match with Bibolotov, he was able to use his guard to stand up pretty quickly. And Bibolotov was able to control him a bit when he stuffed his head against the cage. But uh, Bontrin was able to reverse some takedowns. He took the back of Bibolotov. And, uh, you know, Bontrin is a back-taking specialist. And he also has eight rear naked chokes. He has some arm bars, heel hooks. And he's a dangerous man on the ground. Uh, 11 submissions. And he was submitted in his lone loss. But uh, it was after being stunned. And when Bontrin gets hurt, he will go into, into wrestling mode. And he can be caught. But... He has extra cardio. He will not waver from the task at hand. And he's a warrior that will fight to the finish. And this fight should be a great fight. I'm going to go with Bontrine. Borg should be stronger and better shape at 25. But I haven't liked how striking has looked in his last two fights. I feel like if Bontrine pressures and throws heavy he, how he did versus Paiva, he will be able to potentially hurt Borg. The only issue with doing that versus a guy like Ray is level change. I feel like... Borg will take Bontrine down most likely, but Bontrine will scramble, probably take the back, and, uh, you know, hold his own. I, I don't think Ray will break him or hold him down to control him long. This is going to be a high-paced fight where, you know, I don't see Bontrine getting tired. I don't see him breaking, like you said, and, uh, you know, my pick's going to be Bontrine to win a tough, gritty decision here. So I'm going with Rogerio Bontrine to get it done. Wait, hold up. What? We're about to get to breaking news on here. I didn't. Uh, we're about. I just saw this, so I'm gonna look at it with y'all. But ex champ Nico Montano out of the fight. Okay, so <laughs> fuck that breakdown. I guess that I just gave you guys. So Nico's out of the fight. We'll see if Mesa gets a new opponent. But man, that kind of sucks. <laughs> Breaking news live on the uh, podcast. But uh, we got Jim Muller, Scott Holtzman up next uh, in this matchup. And um, you know Scott Holtzman, he called a shot and he got it. He had the victory over Dong Young Ma. He went on the mic. He asked for Jim Miller and. That's exactly what he got. I'm sure this is a big moment for Holtzman. You know, he's going to fight a legend of the game. And Holtzman, he's been on a good run. He's won four of his last five fights. He comes into this fight a favorite. And uh, Jim Miller, he's turned back the clock. You know, in 2019, he was unbeaten. He was 2-0. Two first-round finishes. And he's looked much better recently. You know, he's back to his finishing ways. In fact, you know, in his last five fights, none have gone past the first round. He has three first-round finishes. And uh, he's getting a slight step up competition here. But... It's still a fighter outside of the top 15. And Jim Miller, you know, he's had 33 total UFC fights. And and he's never lost to someone not ranked the top 15 at the time they fought. So, six of Miller's six losses. They've also come against uh, guys that you see who came against uh, or who are former title challengers or champions. So, he's losing to the cream of the crop. He's not losing to anybody that's, you know, not uh, elite caliber. You know, this is an awesome fight. It has two guys who are stylistically to me pretty similar on the feet. They like to pressure forward, throw hard, low kicks, overhands, hooks, pull counters. And both guys have solid body and head kicks as well. But I feel Miller is tighter with his punches. He mixes in uh, more variations with front elbows, with knees. I feel Holtzman could get, sometimes get a little wild. He could throw wide. He could throw from too far out. And in his match, uh, um, in his last match, he was much more athletic. He was faster. He was using good footwork, head movement. He was hitting and he was not getting hit. But he ended up... Sitting in the pocket, trading, showing bad fight IQ, he got dropped. And Miller is smarter in the way he fights. He's probably going to be the sharper guy in the pocket. The issue for Miller is I feel Holtzman is the bigger, more durable guy. So if he can walk Miller down, land some big shots, wear on him, 
He could hurt him, wear him down, but both guys have solid grappling. Holtzman wrestling, I would say, isn't nearly as good as Miller's, but he's physical. He catches kicks well. And if you can get Miller tired, get on top of him. He has some brutal elbows. And Miller's always been weak off his back. In his fight with Ronaldo, he did win the first round, but he got tired in the second and third, and he lost uh, due to being put on his back. He's been submitted a couple times. His, his grappling is much more technical than Scott Holtzman, though. And he is a nasty double leg, man. I mean, very fast, great timing, very opportunistic with submissions as well. He'll jump on guillotines like you saw in his last match. And Miller, he isn't a fighter like Nick Lentz, who Holtzman struggled with in the grappling, who is going to constantly grind for takedowns. But he's more explosive with the shots. And if he can get his arms around that neck, his opponents are in big trouble. You know, Jim Miller's excellent guillotines, rear nakeds. Uh, he's finished his last three wins by submission, and he has 17 submissions. There's a distinct advantage in the jiu-jitsu realm for Miller here, and Holton only has two submissions. I do feel it would be smart for Scott to work takedowns in the later rounds, late in the rounds maybe as well, to try to get Miller on his back, get him tired, and uh, you know steal the rounds maybe. But Holton needs to constantly walk down Miller, attack the body, try to break him, have a performance similar to Trinaldo's, and uh, Miller's going to be looking to time a shot as Holtzman enters, rock him, jump on the neck, dangle off, get the win, or time a double, uh, take him down, and, uh, you know, win a decision that way. Maybe but Miller has to have a lot of confidence. He's riding two first-round finishes. Holtzman has two finishes in the last three fights as well, so it should be a good one. But my pick is going to be Jim Miller to keep it rolling. I feel like he's just a bit better everywhere than Holtzman, and... As long as he can get takedowns and stop the forward pressure if he doesn't catch him and take him out early, I could see him winning a decision. I think Holtzman will come out jacked up, though, throwing some bombs, get a little wild, and uh, get submitted early on because I think he's going to be pumped up for this fight. But my pick's going to be Jim Miller, first round finish. And next year we have a fight with John Dotson taking on Nathaniel Wood. And uh, the prospect Nathaniel Wood, you know, he started his UFC career 3-0, and three finishes, and... Definitely getting a big step up, step up here. He's getting a chance to take out a fading name, uh, John Dodson. And he's, uh, you know, a good striker. He plants his feet. He has much less movement than Dodson. And I feel like that may be an issue for him here. But he's very quick. He has a nice jab, hard low kicks. He's explosive. Good overhand right as well. And he will throw some counter left hooks. He likes to uh, um, counter with straight right hands with hooks. He's very sharp. Um, he throws a nice left hook. Good front kick, straight right hand combos. A uh, nice front kick to the body. And he looked very good against Andre Ewell. He walked Ewell down. He took it to him. And uh, he was able to uh, use head movement to slip and rip. He has a great chin as well. But he has been hurt on several occasions. He is willing to take shots to give his own. He will throw a lot of volume. He'll attack the body. And he wears on opponents. But if he gets clipped, you know, he does uh, have a bad tendency of backing up to the cage. And, you know, just using a high guard looking for a big shot to return. And, uh, you know, eventually that's going to get him in trouble. But he does have one-punch power if he lands clean. And uh, he holds that power for all three rounds. He did drop his opponent with the jab in his last match. He has nine KO, TKOs. But I feel like he could be a little bit slow closing the distance at times. He can kind of float his chin as well a little bit. But he's shown progression in his game. And he's starting to use his grappling offensively much more. In the UFC, he has three submissions and three wins. And... He timed a nice body lock, nice double leg against Andre Ewell. He was able to control him easily on the mat and uh, landed some big shots from inside of his guard as well. And what's a veteran now? You know, he works smart. He doesn't give up top position stupidly. He has nice back takes, really good rear naked chokes. And in round one against uh, um, Jose Quinones in his last match, he did get taken out with the body lock, but he's able to sweep stand up pretty quickly. And in round two, he took Quinones down, took the back out of another rear naked choke. And he's done that in back-to-back -back fights. It looks like that back take is his thing. He hits it like butter. And, um, you know, he's very technically sound, both on the feet, on the ground. He's excellent front headlocks. He'll jump on Darces. He's very dangerous on the ground. You know, he has good submissions. But I definitely think he's going to struggle to take or hold down a guy like John Dotson. I mean, we haven't seen really anyone be able to do that in the UFC, but... Wood does have five submissions. Uh, obviously, has three submissions in the UFC. And he has been submitted two times, but those were in 2015. And, um, you know, he's extra cardio. He's not going to get tired. And he's going to want to try to push the pace, walk Dotson down, and melt him. But John Dotson, you know, he has fallen in some hard times lately. He's lost three of his last four fights. But, um, you know, um, his last four fights came against fighters all inside the top five. And he's lost two in a row. His last victory was almost two years ago. 
and he hasn't been, and he has been out of uh, out of the octagon for almost a year. So we'll see if that break was beneficial for him or not. But Dotson, you know, he's extremely fast. He's explosive. He, uh, you know, is someone that uses a lot of single punch counters, really with the left hand, and uh, he has KO power, but he's a uh, low output, and he kind of likes to, you know, uh, you know, faint, use some low kicks, try to get you to commit when he can land the left hand, dart in, dart out, angle off, and he's good at attacking the body as well. He's extremely good at landing, angling, almost like playing tag, and he just gets his opponents, you know. Uh, Kind of frustrated until they overextend. He'll knock him out, or they just uh, never can uh, catch up to him on the numbers. But um, you know, the constant moving backwards, the low volume, the barely evading shots does kind of give the judges the impression that he's losing at times, and he's had issues lighting off in recent fights. I would say in his last fight against Petr Jan, uh, Petr Jan, you know, brought it to him, so he was forced to throw more volume, and I feel like he had a better performance in that fight because. He was landing some big shots. He dropped Jan. He got some takedowns. And, um, you know, he, he I thought he looked good in this fight. And he does have 11 knockouts, but he only has once his move up to 135. And, um, you know, he uh, he hasn't had a knockout in seven fights. And he's also never been finished by strikes. So, I mean, he's very durable. You know, Dotson, he doesn't really use his wrestling a lot. He did hit a couple takedowns in his last fight. But he's a state champion wrestler. And, uh... He was tremendous at catching kicks. He'll use that to work takedowns. Uh, he did get a clinch takedown in his last fight. And his takedown defense, you know, is incredible. Um, extremely hard to hold down. And uh, don't think this is going to be much of a uh, grappling match here. I think it's going to predominantly happen on the feet. Dotson always has good cardio. He can get a little bit tired. But, you know, no one pushes the pace like guys like Petr Jan. And he's had close split decisions against the elite, elite of the division, man. Marlon Marais, John Lineker. He gave Petr Jan a good match. And, uh... He beat Pedro Munoz, who's a high-level guy. He's a hard style to deal with, man, and he's it's a tough fight for me to call because at this stage of Dotson's career, it's kind of hard to trust him, but I do think Wood is a very technical striker. He has fast hands. He can blitz in with combinations well, but Dotson has way faster footwork, in my opinion. He angles much better, and he should be able to land and get out versus Wood, but it's just if Wood lands clean and you know, hits him a few times, walks him down. Will that counteract the work Dotson did during the round? You know, I don't think Dotson or Wood's going to be able to outgrapple Dotson like he has his previous opponents. Um, Dotson has the ability to count off the cage. Um, I think that Wood is a similar match to Petr Jan, just not as fast. He doesn't throw as much volume. Not as good as wrestler. Frankly, just not as good anywhere. Um, this fight is in New Mexico, so if it's a close decision, maybe that'll help Dotson this time in terms of getting a decision. And Man, I actually feel like Dotson's going to be able to land, go get out, and uh, get a win by decision here. So, I'm going to pick John Dotson, but not confident in that pick. And up next year, we got Tim Means taking on a newcomer with uh, Daniel Rodriguez. And, you know, Tim Means, you know, he asked for this fight in New Mexico. He, you know, had a big fight in his last fight. It was the last fight in his contract. And he was coming off the first knockout of his career, a big injury. And uh, he punched his ticket, man. He knocked out Thiago Alves, got a new contract, and... Got his fight in New Mexico, so I'm sure he's going to be pumped, ready to go here. And he's taking on a newcomer here in Daniel Rodriguez. And, you know, we all kind of know about uh, Tim Means by now, right? Very sharp striker, good inside, good outside, long, has power, good takedowns as well. Can uh, attack with guillotines, nice knees in the clinch, big elbows, uh, very big ground and pound as well. And uh, Daniel Rodriguez, you know, uh, he has a chip stacked against him here. He's fighting a grizzled veteran who's seen it all, and he... You know, Rodriguez is still relatively green in his career. He does have a victory recently on the Dana White Contender Series. He's won six consecutive fights. He's 10-1. and one, And the one loss was kind of a robbery decision. But uh, Rodriguez, you know, he's a technical guy. He's light on his feet. He has good leg kicks, uh, good lead hand. And he likes to switch stances and uh, use the right jab, chuck right hook. And he'll keep the volume high. He mostly works basics. He throws a lot of jabs, body head. He'll throw some low kicks. He... Likes to get ahead on points, but his right hook has big power. He could shut opponents' lights out with both hands. He'll attack the body with punches as well. And he's a nice jab overhand left. His overhand left is his knockout shot. He'll wing it with full power. He'll he'll throw a you know, jab, duck under, come over the top with big left hooks. And he will overextend. He can leave himself susceptible to counters. And he has to be more tight in this fight. You know, he can't be that wild. And he has to work the basics. You know, chop the legs. 
Once Mean is comp means is compromised a little bit, then starts swinging for the fences maybe. But he's a pressure fighter. He cuts the cage off, and he's just a bruiser. I mean, he looks very durable, and he has to respect the striking of Dirty Bird though. He's never been finished. He's willing to take shots to give shots, and he will turn it up if it's a close fight. But he does hold his hands low. He's susceptible to body shots. He did get hurt to the body versus Rico Farrington, and he's pretty open to being hit. He comes forward. He's uh, a little bit square. He does have six knockouts and. His grappling, you know, he's a 10th planet guy. Um, There's kind of limited footage on him online grappling, but he looks thick, strong for the division. He's uh, pretty decent in the clinch. Good knee knockout in one of his fights. He did hit a body lock, a double against Ferryton. And he seems to like to time double legs in the last 10 seconds of rounds. And in previous fights, you know, I've seen him uh, defend takedowns, uh, move into top position. And, you know, he's pretty good. He'll move to the mound. He'll hunt arm triangles. He'll look for the back. He does have three submissions, but... You know, he isn't a super active grappler. He's a good cardio. He's a dog. He's going to go for it. But I definitely got Tim Means here. He's much more experienced. I feel he's a little bit better everywhere. I think that his forward pressure and the tightness in his punches are going to cause Rodriguez issues. And, you know, for someone who likes to back up in Rodriguez, I don't think that's a good style against a guy like Tim Means. I think once Tim Means starts getting his range, he's going to start going body head. And I think he's going to eventually take Rodriguez out, either via submission or... Uh, TKO. I think Means is much better offensively in the clinch. I think Rodriguez will back. Uh, will be back, but uh, you know he's not going to beat Tim Means here in his hometown on short notice. So I'm going with Tim Means to get it done. Um, this is a tough fight for me to call, and I'm really not going to spend a lot of time from, in this fight because I'm just, you know, I'm not interested in, in it betting wise. But I do think it's going to be a fun fight to watch. Uh, you know, I just don't like trusting Lando, but I think I'm going to have to go with him here. You know, he's. Been more active, he's durable, he has a better pace than Yancey, and Yancey beats a lot of guys due to breaking them, making them, uh, you know, quit, but I don't think he's going to make Lando quit. I think Lando is faster, he has better movement, kicks, hands, uh, he's more dynamic, Yancey's older, he's making the drop back down to 155 again, and he did struggle with that, that's why he went to 170. Um, he's weak to the body at 55, he looked terrible against Gillespie at 55s, um, and you know, I just feel like, uh, you know, I'm going to pick Lando by head kick knockout round one or two. I think Lando's going to get it done. I think he's more dynamic and not a lot of interest in this fight, but going with Lando Venata. <laughs> man, in this fight, man, this one's going to be maybe brutal to watch, but uh, Montana De La Rosa, the uh, um, wife of Mark De La Rosa, she's following him up on the card. She's taking on Mara Romero Barella. And, you know, we have to think, I mean, you have to wonder how her, how she's going to be thinking if her husband loses this fight, but... uh. You know, she did suffer a first setback in the UFC. Her last time out, she got dominated by Andrea Lee. Didn't look great. And, uh, you know, for Mara Mar Romero Barella, you know, she needs to bounce back here. I mean, she got knocked out by Lauren Murphy in her last match. And uh, both these girls I'm not very high on. But, um, you know, I think Montana De La Rosa is a lot better. You know, I was when I was watching tape with Mara Romero Barella, man, I mean, to me, all she really has is physicality, man, because... When you're looking at her, I mean, her striking is terrible. I mean, it's very wild. She'll throw maybe one strike uh, to crash into the clinch. Uh, really has nothing. As, uh, she'll throw some low kicks. Really has nothing in terms of long-range striking. Um, very low volume. And uh, she can be very wild closing distance. Very hittable. She has a weak chin as well. And she can't strike moving backwards. She really does nothing when she's moving backwards. Um... You know, I feel like De La Rosa has a good jab. If she can keep her at the end of her jabs, her end of her kicks, and walks her down, I don't think Brella's going to have much of anything. And Brella, you know, when she can get in the certain position, she's good. Like, when she can get tie-ups in the clinch, she's very strong. She can get some nice takedowns. And if she can move in the mount or the back, she has good submissions there. She uh, has heavy hips. She's hard to get out from under you. But, uh, you know, if you can keep it on the feet, if you can hit her at the chin, she doesn't like getting hit. She doesn't have a good defense. She doesn't have a good chin. And uh, her jiu-jitsu, as she's gotten up in the ranks, has uh, shown to be not that great. So uh, even if she gets De La Rosa down a couple times, I feel like De La Rosa is the girl that's better in the clinch. I think she's better on the ground as well. And, um, you know, I just feel like I, I feel more comfortable picking De La Rosa here because I think that if she could strike moving backwards, she could put damage on uh, Mara. And uh, I don't think Mara's going to necessarily just be able to hold her down and dominate her. If she does, that's going to be very terrible for uh, Montana. So, uh, 
My pick's going to be Montana De La Rosa to win via decision here, but this should probably be a snoozer right here. And then another main card fight here, we got Brock Weaver taking on Rigo Vargas. And uh, Brock Weaver, you know, he's finally making his UFC debut. He had a couple misfires. He was originally supposed to debut late last year, but got pulled from that card. He had some issues with USADA. I think he had, like, high testosterone levels, but it's all been resolved now. And he's going to be fighting against a Mexican fighter in uh, Rodrigo Vargas. And it should be a fun fight. And... Uh, Rodrigo, you know, he's getting a second, uh, you know, opportunity here. He got defeated pretty easily in his debut against uh, Alex Da Silva. Didn't really have a great performance. He actually enters this fight as the biggest underdog on the card. And to me, Vargas is, is very raw. You know, he trains uh, primarily out of Mexican Pride Gym, which is a gym that I believe is his own gym. Uh, it's a very weak gym, in my opinion. Uh, doesn't have great fighters. He's actually the head coach there, and he's the best fighter in the gym. So, I imagine he's doing all his game plans, everything himself, and recently he has been bouncing around, going to a bunch of different gyms, and uh, I don't necessarily know who's going to be in his corner for this fight. Uh, I don't think he has a head coach, so don't really like Kazula's, uh, you know, I don't like, um, you know, his training. I don't like, you know, I don't like the way that he's been having his training camp for this fight. And to me, man, I mean, the UFC's trying to get Brock Weaver a win here, trying to get him a win on a big spot. Because uh, I believe I was listening to one of his interviews and uh, he was saying that New Mexico has one of the biggest populations for uh, Native Americans in the United States. Which Brock Weaver, you know, he's a very proud Native American. He has the whole, uh, you know, headdress, everything that he wears out to the cage. And, uh, you know, so I feel like he's going to be able to connect with the crowd here. He, uh, he's good with words as well. And in this fight, man, I just think he has all the advantages here. I mean, he's a bigger guy. He fought at 170 in his last fight. He's going to be significantly taller. Um, he's going to have a reach advantage. I feel like he's a better boxer as well. Definitely throws more volume. Uh, the only thing that he has to be worried about is Rodrigo does have some dangerous head kicks. Early on, he will throw hard. And if they go in there early on and he's like an idiot like Alex Morono and they want to swing for the fences, I don't think that Vargas necessarily has that uh, explosive ability like Chaos Williams. He doesn't... And, uh, but he can, you know, knock you out. So Weaver can't be dumb in there. But Weaver's a very durable guy. And uh, Weaver's a guy who prides himself on breaking people with grappling. Which, uh, he is a legit black or brown belt. And Rodrigo's not a very good grappler. I mean, we saw in his last fight, he continuously got his back taken. He got taken down at will. I've seen him get taken down on the regional scene a lot. And, um, you know, it gets kind of like Brock Weaver. If Weaver could start getting him against the cage... Uh, Beat him up against the cage a little bit, getting takedowns, wearing on him. I think he's going to really pull away with the fight. And I feel like uh, Weaver's going to maybe submit this guy eventually. I just feel like Weaver's on another level um, over Vargas. I think he's better everywhere. Um, you know, I think Weaver, you know, maybe potentially could be a, a action guy. Maybe like a Mike Perry type guy where he's going to be fun to watch. Uh, uh, he's going to be have a fun personality in the UFC. He's maybe going to brand him as kind of like, you know, that type of guy that, you know, he's he's going to be in fan-friendly fights. So I think that that's kind of what they're wanting to do with Brock Weaver. I know Brock Weaver is one to America top team. He's worked with some good guys over there. And I just think he's he's a lot better than uh, Rodrigo Vargas, in my opinion. So uh, he's also the younger guy. He's more in his prime. And I'm going with uh, Brock Weaver to get the win here. And uh, probably to get a submission. And I'm next year we got another fight that I'm not going to spend a ton of time on. It's another late fight. Uh, Devin Clark, Daquan Townsend. And, uh, you know, um, Daquan, he fought like three weeks ago, man. And he fought another guy that also uh, um, turned out of Jackson Week MMA and Bavon Lewis. So, uh, obviously, I feel like Devin Clark has probably seen him fight. He's probably thinking, yeah, I could beat this guy. So he accepted the fight. And, uh, you know, Devin Clark, man, he's definitely fought the way higher level competition. I mean, you could argue he's fought Jan Blahovic. He's fought... Uh, you know, Alexander Rocket. He's fought some of the cream of the crop at 205. He is coming off of a loss to Ryan Spann. And uh, he was winning that fight until he lost. And that seems to happen in a lot of Devin Clark's fights. He has the physicality. He has the skills everywhere. But um, has these lapses in judgment. He can get very spastic and uh, lose the fight. And against a guy like Daquan, that's going to be Daquan's only chance to win here. Is if Devin Clark uh, does something dumb and gets knocked out, gets tired and gets knocked out. Because... Uh, Man, I mean, we saw in Daquan's last fight, his, his uh, you know, issues with grappling is very evident. He couldn't get off the cage. Uh, Bavon was taking him down. And uh, he's fighting a guy who's a lot bigger in this fight. He's a former 205er who, in my opinion, he's more explosive than Bavon. 
in my opinion, is obviously a better wrestler. And, um, you know, I don't see why uh, Devin Clark wouldn't hold this guy against the cage, why Devin Clark wouldn't take this guy down, and why he wouldn't win this fight. So, uh, to me, man, this is a pretty easy fight for Devin Clark. Uh, get a bounce back win here and uh, maybe even get a finish. I mean, I've heard him talk about getting a knockout, but uh, my pick's going to be Devin Clark to come out here, uh, give Daquan his third loss in the UFC, and uh, probably send him, uh, you know, send him home, send him cut. So, going with Devin Clark to bounce back at the win here. And I'm not sure Michelle Pierre taking on Diego Sanchez. What a fucking fight this is, right? We got a break dancer taking on a, a wild man in here. But, man, I mean, Michelle Pierre kind of embarrassed himself in his last fight the way that he missed weight and he was jumping all around. He was looking like an idiot. And, um, you know, he um <laughs> gassed out and lost the fight to a 55 on short notice. So, now he's fighting another guy that probably should be fighting at 155 pounds. But he's fighting a guy that's uh, seen it all. He's done it all. And a guy that, you know, in hindsight, in his last fight against uh, Michael Chiesa, I mean, he didn't look terrible in that fight in hindsight after seeing how Chiesa looked against uh, RDA. Sanchez had some decent moments in that fight. He didn't get finished. He was always scrambling. He got out of some bad positions and uh, kept the cardio going. But the only thing I don't really like about Diego recently is he's running around with that guy Joshua Fabia, School of Self-Awareness and all that. And he's always been a wild guy, but... uh. You know, to me, this basically Diego just running his own camps, doing his thing. Cause I just don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know this Joshua Fabio guy. I don't want to say I have no respect for him. I don't want to say that he doesn't know what he's doing, but he has to prove it to me, man. Cause this courting in his last fight was real embarrassing, and uh, hopefully uh, he's a little bit better here. But uh, man, I mean, actually looking at the matchup in this fight, uh, Pereira man is just a guy I've never been impressed with. I mean, if he lands a front flip or. A, flying knee or something crazy on Diego and knocks him out, then he's going to knock him out. But that's going to have to happen early in the fight. I mean, he's going to, I don't think it's going to happen in the second or the third round. I really don't. And, um, you know, the thing with Michelle, man, is when you walk him down, he will, you know, rip the body with some big shots, rip the head. Maybe he's explosive, but he doesn't like being walked down. He doesn't like being hit. And Diego, you know, the one thing that he will do is he will walk you down and he will hit you. And when Michelle's forced to grapple like it's Tristan Connolly, he gassed out really fast. I mean, within three minutes, man. And uh, if you're gassing out that quick, it's Diego. Diego's going to finish you off, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, in this fight, man, uh, you know, Michelle, I don't think he likes getting hit either. Everyone likes to talk about Diego not being extremely durable. But I don't think Michelle is that durable either. I mean, when he gets hit, he gets rocked. He actually likes to go to grappling when he gets hit as well. And I think Diego's just a much, much better grappler than him. And um, I actually favor Diego in this fight pretty. I Actually, you know, when I was watching the footage on this, uh, I was thinking Diego should be like minus 175, man. I really think Diego, I think he should win this fight, man. I think he has the better cardio. I think that he's seen much higher level competition. He's seen the much better guys. He has much more experience. I think that he is, even though, like I said, he's hanging around with that guy, the trainer, but I think that he has a good mindset. He's going to want to go in here and kill this guy, and I don't think he's going to freeze, you know. Michelle, he wins fights because guys freeze when he does all this craziness, and then he catches them with a flying knee or something stupid, and they get knocked out, and Diego, I don't think he's going to freeze. I think Diego's going to be in his face, and if he gets caught early, he gets caught early, but I think if he survives those first couple minutes, I think if he gets one takedown, I think it's Diego's fight to lose, so... My pick's going to be Diego, the Nightmore Sanchez, to uh, win via third round team. And number two, we have the main event. We have the rematch with uh, Corey Anderson taking on Jan Blahovich. And uh, the first fight, you know, Corey Anderson absolutely dominated Blahovich, uh, Beat him down, landed like two, over 200 significant strikes. Uh, had Jan, uh, you know, doubled over in the fetal position after the fight. Extremely exhausted. Uh, those are some things you never forget, man. And Jan's going to have to get over that mentally because... Corey broke him in that fight, and uh, Jan knows that he broke in that fight. So that's something that he's going to have to, uh, you know, get over, and that's a big hurdle. But, you know, obviously both these guys, they've been on big roles. Corey Anderson, he's won four in a row. He's beaten guys like Glover Teixeira, who's a beast. Alir, who's a beast. Johnny Walker, who's a beast. And uh, Jan Blahovich, you know, he's coming off of big wins over uh, Jacare Souza, Luke Rockhold, former, you know, elite guys, champions. Um... And he's also, you know, I think 6-1 in his last seven fights. But when you look deeper into Jan Blahovic's streak of fights, I mean, he did beat Devin Clark, who's a wrestler. But if you remember in that fight, he did get taken down. He lost the first round. And uh, 
He beat Jerry Kennedy. He's a striker. Jimmy Manuel was a striker. Nikita Krilov, uh, you know, he did submit Nikita, but Nikita gets submitted a lot. And Nikita did get a takedown, a couple takedowns in that fight. Chago Santos took down Jan, but he's also a striker. Luke Rockhold, um, you know, he tried to grapple in that fight, but he didn't set up the grappling with his hands in that fight. And Luke isn't necessarily a wrestler to me. I mean, he had two takedowns in the last five fights. Jacare, he had one take or one takedown, I believe, in his last five fights. So those guys aren't taking guys down like Corey Anderson. Corey Anderson is taking guys down like Glover Teixeira, who's an animal, ten times in a fight. And in this, if you watch the first fight, man, with Jan and Corey Anderson, Jan was the better striker in that fight. I mean, uh, or I mean, Corey was the better striker in that fight. He was faster. He was hitting him with the jab. He was going body head up down. And uh, throwing these uppercuts, cheeky hooks. And that was what opening up his takedown attempts. And I feel like nothing's going to change, man. I just think that I think that it's going to be the same thing. I think that Corey's going to be faster with the jab. I think that Corey's going to be able to land up, down. I think that he's going to set up the strikes with the hands, which is what Luke Rockhold, what um, Jock Ray Souza weren't willing to do. And um, when he sets up those strikes with the hands, I think that Jan's going to be thinking so much about the takedown because obviously, you know, Jan got taken down in that fight. He couldn't get up off his back and he got destroyed on the ground. So I think that the level changes, the feints are really going to open up the striking for Corey in this fight. And uh, I think that he might even be able to hurt Jan on the feet as well. But uh, I think the jab and the leg kicks are going to be a big thing. I think he's going to be going up and down with the striking, getting takedowns. And um, man, I mean, I'm just not sold on. I know Jan, I see people saying he's. Defended 14 out of his last 16 takedowns, but when he fights grapplers, man, I mean, this guy doesn't, he doesn't do well. I mean, Alexander Gustafson took him down, um, Patrick Cummings, uh, obviously Corey Anderson put a clinic on him, and, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people think that maybe Jan's going to get a knockout because Corey has been susceptible to getting knocked out in the past, but look at the guys that knocked him out. I mean, Ovid St. Pru knocked him out with a brutal, devastating head kick. I mean, that head kick would knock out anyone in the division. So, to me, that's almost like a mute thing. Then he knocked, uh, got knocked out by Jimmy Manawa, who is a, a knockout artist with one-punch power, where I wouldn't necessarily call Jan you know, a knockout artist. You know, especially with the hands. I mean, he only has six career knockouts and 20, uh, 25 wins. And uh, a lot of those are with body kicks, which his kicks are going to be muted because of the uh, takedowns of Corey Anderson, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, the... Like I said, I mean, I just, I don't know, man. I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's going to be any different. I think it's going to be exactly the same. I think that it's going to be Corey Anderson going up, down, landing shots, body head, um, and uh, getting takedowns, wearing on Jan, and I think that he's probably going to break him again and maybe even get a TKO this time because it is two extra rounds. Uh, I think Corey has a big Y right now. Like, he has a big chip on his shoulder. He thinks that he's always getting a... Uh, overlooked people don't believe in him people don't like him and he's gonna want to go in there and prove something wrong it's kind of like the tyron woodley uh thing when he was uh, battling when he was fighting all those guys in his uh title defenses he kind of uh you know had his back against the wall where people were thinking he was gonna lose where he was thinking that the ufc wanted him to lose and that's kind of where Corey anderson is at in my opinion and i think Corey anderson is gonna go in there and uh put a statement on there and uh Really dominant Jan Blahovich again. And Corey's actually my most confident pick on the whole card. So that kind of shows you where I'm at in terms of uh, what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking that Corey Anderson's going to go in there and uh, get it done. And I've always had a lot of faith in Corey Anderson. And uh, he seems like he's finally putting all of his skills together. So I'm happy to see that. And uh, hopefully that continues. Hopefully he wins this fight, gets a title shot. And um, my pick's going to be Corey Anderson. And uh, for the parlay of the week this week, I'm going to do Marab Divalashvili and Brock Weaver as the parlay of the week. Like I said, Corey Anderson is uh, my most confident pick of the night. And for the uh, upside of the night, I'm going to do Diego Sanchez. But, um, you know, I think Rogerio Bontrain also has a good chance of upsetting along with uh, um, Jim Miller. Obviously, I picked um, John Dotson as an underdog as well. But in terms of a bet, I don't know if I would necessarily trust Jim Miller. Uh, Nico was an underdog as well, but obviously we figured out live on this thing that uh, Macy or Nico pulled out. So uh, we'll see if Macy gets a new fight. But yeah, guys, thanks for listening. Um, uh, come back next week. Comment, like, subscribe. But 
put down in the comments what you're betting on, what you think of my picks, if you ag agreed with the decisions last week, or which decisions you didn't agree with. Uh, and, um, yeah, let's look forward to watching this UFC Rio Ranch show and uh, making some money.